WrestlingOfPodcasts.com proudly presents the Wrestling Is Real Podcast. Because wrestling needs us. Brought to you by KingOfAmazon.com. KOP is all about Amazon. And so should you. Go to King of Podcasts special link at KingOfAmazon.com. Here we are, episode 569 of the Wrestling Is Real Podcast right now. Let's go. Time tonight to go ahead and talk about what I call WWE's maligned main roster of misguided NXT misfit mid-carters. A lot of alliteration. You know, I like doing that just to be quirky and fun on these titles of these shows. But really, it is very uh, appropriate for tonight's conversation because quite a few people are talking about the really just the misuse of anything coming out of the Performance Center. When you look at what the Performance Center has provided, the talent, the ability of the wrestlers. I mean, I try to think about the fact of when the scouts are going out there. I know they're looking for the best wrestlers. I mean, when you think about William Regal or Triple H or others going out to PWG or Evolve or going out to Europe to, you know, World of Sport or, you know, whatever kind of wrestling out there, or maybe going to Japan or we're just watching the new Japan shows, right? And you ask yourself, what do the, is there any consideration of saying, does this wrestler, this potential WWE superstar, do they match, do they do they pass the Vince test? And I don't think they ever think about that. But again, we're in a corporate environment in WWE because they're just looking for wrestlers to fill roles. It's very funny where Rusev, a.k.a. Miro, goes out on AEW tonight talking about how he was in WWE for 10 years. It's amazing he was there for 10 years. That's, that's long. really, I couldn't believe it's that long. And that he was trying to go after an uh, inanimate object, a brass ring that was never there. <clears throat> so he really felt like he was utilized poorly. And I'm going to say he was. Again, after the John Cena Rusev match, the WrestleMania where Rusev comes out of a tank, I have referred to this many times before. When you think about the fact that Regardless of what people think about how the character is or, you know, that some of the WWE purists, some of my podcast podcast brother would like to go and call some of these wrestlers that are former WWE cast offs, right? They like to go and just call them washed up. Meanwhile, when they first came in, they were all up and at it and they were so inspired by some of these wrestlers coming in. But then you also forget about that, the potential of their indie stardom. Or the potential they brought from another organization that was on television. Okay, you have all of that. But then you bring them in. The Performance Center, more or less, you know, they are a good polishing school. More or less a finishing school to get the wrestlers better equipped and better adept to wrestling. You know, really to be able to go and do wrestling in front of the crowds, in front of the live crowds, and really be able to put on a performance in the ring. But we know that's not the only asset that you need to have. The other tangible asset you need to be a WWE superstar is in sports entertainment. You need to be able to talk. You need to be able to be given a gimmick, a role, a dimension or two or three to be able to go ahead and truly give some context, something that will create the real character. Because when you're putting a one-dimensional character out there, like they've done with many, many wrestlers, yes, they're... Really, they're generic. They're carbon copy. They're cookie cutter. That's why we call them that. Because one dimension doesn't do anything. We need multiple dimensions. We need multiple layers. And some of those multiple layers are done the wrong way because what they're doing is trying to patch up something that has been broken by WWE because they don't know how to fix it. So they'll put a comedy act in front of an act or they'll do something where they'll try to recreate or do something with a stupid gimmick to go with it, right? We see that. I mean, how many wrestlers do we have to see right now that have gone through and get gimmicks that are goofy, right? Really, 
I think of some of the names. Okay, Giant Bernard. You know, remember Albert? He was kind of like always just like a goofy sidekick kind of character. Giant Bernard, as Giant Bernard, after his run with Test in WWF, WWE, he goes to New Japan, becomes prominent. Then they bring him in as Lord Tensai. Anyways, then they pair him with Brodus Clay, who is also a character that was brought in strong in NXT and then brought into the, or actually was uh, brought in from the uh, FCW days, right? Comes in and then they're both brought in into a comedy act because that's what they're going to do. You know, Brodus Clay, Brontosaurus, and then Tensai, you know, Sweet Tea, like goofy because there's nothing else they can do. And they did that because there were some times where there were certain things that that WWE could do in the Attitude Era where they could get away with things like that because things were so hot. Because it didn't matter what the mid-card was. It didn't matter at all. You could make Steve Blackman a joke. You could make Goldust a joke. You could make Jim Duggan a joke. But the thing was, you could get away with that back then because, you know, that was just the filler. Because people were all waiting for the big stars to come out later. Like, okay, New Age Outlaws, D-Generation X, Austin, Rock, Undertaker, Triple H. That's what they're waiting for. Foley. That's what they're waiting for. But they don't have that now. And they keep going back to the well. Look at some of the stars they've brought together that were NXT. You know, I don't know if they were standouts or not. But again, they were brought in and also have had long runs in this company. When I take a Johnny Curtis... And Mike Dalton, or then later called Tyler Breeze, and Fandango, and Breezango. Now, look at what they've done. You have run these guys to the ringer in every different comedy sense, fashion police. You, you know, put them together in own gimmick roles, one-dimensional, right? That they actually went really well going back to NXT. Let's not forget. Good hot starts for both. And then all of a sudden, drawn down, is it because Vince doesn't like it or is it because somebody else is there and they just fall off the map and that's it. And there's nothing else that can be done. These kind of problems are too rampant and it's chronic. It's consistent. And don't tell me because it was Paul Heyman that was there or not, or Bruce Pitcher was there or not, or if it's Vince, I mean, it's all about Vince. And we see that. And the one thing that stirs everybody up right now, the wrestling audience, the fans, they get stirred up more because, remember, in March, when all these different players were let go of their contracts, some of them were furloughed or laid off, rather, and then some were just cut. Remember, we had a massive cut. And look where they all went. We've seen, okay, FTR is now in AEW, Miro in AEW, Matt Cardona in AEW, just to name a few. Then you look at Impact Wrestling, you see the Good Brothers in Impact Wrestling. You know, you see Eric Young back in Impact Wrestling. You see Heath in Impact Wrestling. You see Brian Myers in Impact Wrestling. I mean, just that's what happens. And then everybody that's a WWE purist, they're the the, the Bumble fans. They're going to go ahead and trash on every character that goes on all these channels. So all I heard about Sam Aversary was, oh, look at this has been. Look at this has been. Look at this has been. Same thing I heard about All Out. Look at this has been. Look at this has been. Look at this has been. I mean, again, it's just trashing. But they're doing that because it's in denial. There's a denial of how bad the product is. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know what, WWE, in the same vein that other companies are, they don't know how to build stars. They don't know how to go and build these stars into something with tangible assets. Remember, sure, they might have gotten the exposure from WWE, right? They got the machine behind them. So you know who they are. You got a character. You know something like you're going to recognize who they are. The problem is just the recognition is bad. If that's all you got. And then you have stars that come in from other companies and they just use some chant that was being used before because, you know, the wrestling fans, they just kind of go along. They know what it's like. WWE uses the fans like clapping seals. Here you go. You got to see this is awesome here. Here's where you go and say this just gimmick, whatever that is this, right? Miro gets Miro Day. Jericho's match with Orange Cassidy. He gets Y2J chance still. 
because some people are going to just not help themselves. It's they're ingrained because of their work in WWE. And there's only certain stars who are able to go ahead and build themselves up to get to a certain point where they are. They go from some other company to another company and they just stand out. But it's just not here. And this is a constant problem. But again, it's it's really revealing his head once again because we see, as we've talked about before, and you know what? I know the podcast brethren, the wrestling fans out there, they always want to give this company and Vince the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, I've gotten tired of going through that. I mean, the la- doing this show almost eight years coming up in December, I've gone through this again. Five hundred sixty-nine shows. I can't tell me. T- I can't tell you how many times I've gone through trying to talk about the potential of somebody, the potential, 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 and what happens is it's a failing upon this company to not do something right by the stars. They're brought here for a reason. Listen, the talent scouts are doing their damn job. There's not even a question there. But for this company to fail every time, are they getting enough? Because here's the thing. It's the disconnect, first of all, from NXT to the main roster. And then I think with the NXT setup, when I think about it, there's a disconnect from the performance center to NXT. Like, really, there's a full disconnect. And this is a corporation, you would think there would be a chain of command. There will be a chain of communication here that keeps everything continuous and logical and sensical. But there's not. This company, as an entertainment company, does a bad job of consistency across the board when it comes to their storylines, the stories they tell on television, when it comes to what they do with the wrestlers themselves to build them up, to develop them, to make them interesting. They're still not doing that either, right? These are the constant problems they have. And what are you going to do about this? What else can be done? When you look at Keith Lee, everybody so up and at it, ready to see him shine. And now they're starting to feel like he's a casualty. Like, okay, you brought him to the main roster. He's only been here for a few months. He had such a bright star during Survivor Series. And all of a sudden, you throw him in with Randy Orton, and whatever reason, Randy Orton, Keith Lee, just do not mix. It's oil and water. They had matches. They were not special. And I don't know what that means about Randy Orton. Again, he's a great wrestler. But again, I don't think this is the guy that he, he really, I don't ever feel like Randy Orton wants to be the guy to that really gets inspired to work with talent on the coming up. Because I think it's sort of the understanding that, you know what? If Vince doesn't really feel behind this guy, why should he? Because I think, I think Randy is a, is a true loyalist. Okay, the guy's comp- he's company line. He toes it perfectly. He might have not done that so much before, but again, he toes the company line. He knows where his bread is butter. And so does he feel like he's going to go ahead and you know put his legacy out there to put over Keith Lee? What does it do for him? I mean, you think about it, there is a point where Drew McIntyre, okay, there's a difference. Drew McIntyre had been around for a long-ass time. Randy Orton knows that Drew McIntyre was in this company and was, you know, it was a project for Vince, the chosen one. We all remember that. And then Drew McIntyre, even though he comes back again, look at him. I mean, he came back. I still think his impact wrestling run was very important. If he did not do that as Drew Galloway, he does not come back in here as Drew McIntyre, and he does not become champion. They had the feud with him and Randy Orton. It was not bad at all. And Drew McIntyre, they continue it right now. And Drew McIntyre, he fits. Again, Keith Lee was a placeholder for Randy Orton while they waited to bring Drew McIntyre back to sell the punt. And look where we are now. And look, Drew McIntyre back into the mix. And where's Keith Lee? He's out of the picture. Used for a moment with some hype and then out. And what do you expect from this company? This is why I'm afraid. And again, we can't worry about Karrion Cross because he's he's injured. He's not coming back for a while to NXT. 
But this is the problem I have with every wrestler, and it doesn't even matter how good the star is. Karrion Cross should be able to, whenever he gets back, if he wouldn't have gotten injured, he would have been tremendous coming into the main roster. I think he would have overcome the the true fiery hoops of obstacles that Vince McMahon puts in the way. Even Bruce Pritchard and others, I don't think they could misbook that talent. But they obviously prove us wrong, and they are more than capable of fucking up with the talent and making mistakes with them because they keep doing it. Matt Riddle, same thing. We are just repeating. We are just repeating the cycle. Wash, rinse, repeat. They just can't help themselves. It's like, okay, what is this old thing from the Attitude Era we can do? Let's put them here. Or let's do something like this here. When you look at what we have right now in the current state of the company across the board, what we already see raw is just, it's, it's just a hodgepodge. I mean, it's... It's bad. The underground segments are not working. And this company is incapable of letting the underground segments go because Shane McMahon's running it. So the nepotism of this company also does not help. The nepotism of this company by having Shane do this gimmick. Because why, why else is he doing this for? I mean, this is probably some idea of his. He's going with it. It is giving a chance to incorporate some other stars. Is it helping Kevin Owens? Is it helping Shayna Baszler? Is it helping Nia Jax? No. Will it make something out of Riddick Moss? I mean, it could be. Maybe. Like, maybe with some of these MMA-style stars, we'll get something out of it. Some of these four football stars, when you see the size and shape, and you can just kind of make something out of that, possibly. But I'm not ruling it out yet. I'm not ready to go ahead and say yes or no. And then you look at what they put together. Okay, Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton. Yes, great feud. I like it. That still has been solid to me. I enjoy it. Now, on Raw as well, so we do the heel turn. Okay, why the fuck do we go ahead and book three weeks, at least three weeks of storylines in the one night? Only this company does that with Cedric Alexander. This is how much they care. And by the way, Cedric Alexander, for those that don't remember, okay, I don't think anybody talks about 205 Live at all. But, you know, being positioned in 205 Live doesn't mean much at all. For Cedric Alexander to be a dominant force in 205 Live, like nobody's talking about it. Is it even on right now? I don't even think it's going on. So you have that going for you, and you're saying to yourself, okay, He's a cruiserweight. You've already positioned Ricochet. Well, not Ricochet. Ricochet has been main roster. But Cedric Alexander was always positioned 205 Live. Cruiserweight, you've been pegged. You have the letter. You've got the scarlet letter. You are pegged. You are going to be stuck with that. That's it. Cruiserweight Classic, you were part of that. We're not going to think about anything when it comes to your run in Ring of Honor where you were, uh, where you had a long run there. And Cedric Alexander, for whatever reason, you know, now they're going to put him in. And this is the guy they're going to go ahead and put after all the, really, the mishaps, the the mismanagement of a character like this. Because I don't think they've been putting much behind him at all since his start. Not really at all. The 205 Live thing, eh, we're just like, oh, it's just a place, it's a, it's, it's a place for him to be. He'll do good there. He'll do good matches. But where he's not going to be, you know, he's nowhere considered main roster. Vince doesn't thinking he's not big enough. So now you're going to put Cedric Alexander into a heel turn, and then you're going to have him join her business. And then you're going to have him have his first match in the hurt business. Does this make sense to you? This is a very WCW Nitro Thunder kind of thing. Okay? This feels like when Hogan had to work with Kidman. It feels like that. I mean, there's no good to the, that goes with this. Does Cedric Alexander get anything big out of this? Let's be honest. On Raw, the person getting the biggest push right now is Dominic Mysterio. Fucking nepotism. Don't get me wrong. He's not bad. But really, this is the person we're going to get behind. For whatever reason, Ray Mysterio's there. It doesn't matter what he's going to do. 
He sees an opportunity for his son to get out there and work. But again, Dominic Mysterio, I mean, I don't know if he worked in Mexico or if he uh, what, what his real background. I think he was just training. Was he even working anywhere before we got to this point? I don't know. But this guy wasn't working AAA or CMLL, right? I didn't work. I didn't see him working anywhere else. He's what, 20, 21 years old. And he comes out here. This is the guy we're going to bring out here. Like, don't get me wrong. He's done pretty well. I mean, for what it's worth, the booking has been interesting. But this is David Flair. This is a David Flair from like WCW 92, 1999, 2000. Okay. What good, what purpose does this have? Do you think Dominic Mysterio is going to be like the next big star? Are you going to put like the, I, well, I guess it doesn't matter because the, is there any prestige behind the U.S. title or the IC title? Do you feel anything with Apollo Crews holding that belt? Do you feel any real prestige behind any title that's not the heavyweight titles? I mean, ask yourself that. I mean, I guess Oscar is Raw Women's Champion, sure. Bailey, sure. There's you know, legitimacy to that. The tag titles? No. Not really. I just feel like the, the tag titles on both brands just get used to be something to just give a reason to have some matches that might have some belts behind it, but really nothing else. But the belts for any mid carters they don't, or they're not worth anything than the metal they're put on. Like it really is. It, there's no prestige behind it. They're booked so badly. The, the belts are booked badly, except for the heavyweight titles, the men's heavyweight titles. And then you look at the other people that we have that you put in. Okay. So look here. So you're going to put these three older guys and you're going to, okay, let me give you another version. How about this? Remember the West Texas Rednecks. That's another version of this, right? I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the nepotism and the things that go on here that are so nitro TNA impact bullshit, okay? So again, West Texas Rednecks, right? West Texas Rednecks. So, I mean, God, man. Like, I can think of a lot of different ways. That was Kendall William, Kendall William Jr. that was in that, right? And he was never anything like his brother. He was never like Barry, right? I think about Garrett, <laughs> Garrett Bischoff and Aces and Eights. Remember that shit? Same thing. David Flair. This is the same shit with Dominic Mysterio. And then looking with Cedric Alexander coming in, the young guy coming in, his old person organization. Her business, bunch of 40-year-olds. Okay, kid. Let's get you out there, kid. Like, it's that. Is that really going to work for anybody? Is that really going to stand out for anyone? Do you feel like there is any real draw to that? Is Cedric Alexander going to be some major star after this? Why is the focus not on a Keith Lee? Why is the focus not on a Matt Riddle more when you have nobody else? I mean, you keep positioning people that have been around forever. When I look at Raw, okay, McIntyre attacking Orton this past week. And n- numerous segments with the Hurt Business and Cedric Alexander to tell that story in one night. Street Profits. They've become a joke tag team. It's not working. And to think the crowd was so into this group in NXT because they were kind of left with a street cred. Now they're jokey. Montez Ford doing the thing with the ropes and fam, I'm so tired of it. And we want the smoke. The we want the smoke part was part of like a, a like a kind of like a hard, you know, aggressive kind of thing. It's now a jokey. All of it. Viking Raiders, war machine. How do you make them soft? How do you make them? Oh, look, you know, everybody likes Ivar. The girls like her, him over Eric, all that bullshit. How do you get to the point where you have these stars and you decide to go? And by the way, two of the biggest menacing, intimidating people that you had, authors of pain, waved. Future endeavored. <laughs> I don't know why, but they did. Then, uh, by the way, Andre, Andrade and Joe Garza. I mean, they're bringing the the, the cute chick, uh, Aaron Burnett, whatever, uh, whatever her name is. Uh, I forget. 
I see that and I'm saying to myself, all right, why is the young bachelorette chick, what's the real use of her being out there? And Angel Garza, whatever, it's like, I don't care about the breakup of Andrade and Angel Garza. It doesn't make sense. Andrade being put into a tag team all this time and nothing, nothing. Remember not too long ago, Humberto Carrillo was like a big deal, was going to be like the made the big deal and then dropped from existence. We don't even see him anymore. You're giving us Peyton Royce and Billy Kay. What is this? The beautiful, beautiful people break up. We're getting Velvet Sky versus Angelina Love. Is this what we're getting? Like, who thought this was an? I mean, you know, why is this story something to put in? The Iconics were they really that much over? Listen, I like them. I like them as people. I don't know if they were that great as wrestlers. They're, I mean, they were divas. They are divas from back in the day. That's part of the reason why they're up here. Let's be honest, because these two were not working like in shimmer or shine or glow or or not glow, excuse me, or WXW, things like that, or wow. They weren't working anywhere like that. If they were in Australia, we didn't hear about them. But here we are. It's like, yeah, this match didn't mean anything. It's like Peyton Royce, that's the person they want to get behind. She's the hotter one, I guess, and that's what they want. I like them both. Okay, but... Again, beautiful girls are looking on TV. That's the divas thing. I thought we were trying to move away from that. But I guess there's still still room for that for the guys to watch the pretty chicks out there running around the ring. Okay, fine. But again, this is the mentality of the people that are out of touch in the back. The Bruce Pritchers of the world. The Vince McMahons of the world. Out of touch. They don't know what's going on. They, they are so messed up. Then the Murphy thing because Seth Rollins is upset with them. Like, it doesn't matter either. And now Murphy kind of like just, you know, whatever. And I guess Murphy's leaving too or whatever because uh, the whole Australia visa thing or something, I guess. I don't know. I really have not paid attention. And that's what we got. And then again, you see the VIP lounge and the announcement of Cedric Alexander is going to join the Herb business. Viking Raiders come out there. And then they have instant match. Oh, my God. Instant matches. I'm done with instant matches. Seriously, let's stop doing instant fucking matches. Let's wait a week. Wait a week. Wait a couple of weeks. Is it only for pay-per-views to do that? That you can wait? Why do we have instant matches like that? Why can't we have anticipation? What is so wrong with that? I mean, I know I've asked this question, but again, it's still falling on deaf ears. I'm just trying one more time. DQ finish for Randy Orton Keith Lee because we can't have them win. Again, Lee got a win at payback, but a DQ here. Oh, no, excuse me. Randy Orton beat Keith Lee by DQ. So, again, Keith Lee can't get the win here. The payback match that means nothing, and the Orton win over here is the one that we're going to watch. We've heard that. We know that's how it is. Whatever. And then the TGI Fridays type booking, when you're like, oh, let's just rotate a couple of wrestlers together and we'll just kind of work them around. They'll just work the same tables, right? Riot Squad, Shayna Baszler, Nia Jax, let's just put two matches together and make them two on ones. Filler. Fucking filler time for this show. Now, there's one thing to be said about the SmackDown talent and the way they set things up on that show because of the fact that there's established talent there. And, you know, it's kind of hard to fuck that up, okay? When you have Roman Reigns now on that side with Paul Heyman, when you have Braun Strowman, when you have Bray Wyatt, when you have AJ Styles, it is kind of tough to go ahead and fuck that with Sasha and Bailey. It's kind of hard to fuck that up, okay? Again, I just look at the Raw show. It's so bad. Your main event is Dominic Mysterio and Murphy in a street fight. This is where it is. This this is where we are. Nothing. So you couldn't have given us the Randy Orton. But again, I forgot. I forgot. Yes. Raw needs to just put some kind of match up because they don't care about the third hour. They don't give a shit. They put the Raw Underground thing. So they don't give a shit what the third hour is going to be. And of course it goes down. You can't tell me the two hours thing is an excuse anymore. Sorry, Trips. I can't believe it anymore. Hunter, keep using that fucking excuse. It doesn't make sense. 
well, you know, you know, uh, we got, we, if we only had to go and do the two hours, uh, no, man, no. I don't care if you bring this down to a fucking hour. It's still, you can't do it the way you're doing it right now and make it succinct, make it extremely engaging. I can't tell you for how long I put on raw. It is background noise to me now. I have it on. I'm doing other stuff on my computer, but I am watching it and I keep, I'll look up. What are they doing? Oh, it's the same bullshit. I can time my bathroom breaks. I can time snack breaks. I can time phone calls around the shit they do. Did you think I sat around and watched the two on one handicap matches? Fuck no. You think I went ahead and sit around and watch the VIP lounge and put Cedric Alexander in this and all that shit? Fuck no. Do you think I paid attention? Glued my eyes to the screen? <laughs> you, you're out of your mind. Natalia and Lana against Asuka and Mickey James. You think I sat around for that shit? This is not even fucking thunder anymore. It's worse. I mean, Bruce Pritchard. Fuck, man. Did you just take everything that the worst shit that Kevin Sullivan, Bob Mould, and Bob Ryder used to go and put together at Nitro and Thunder? Did you really take that? You're not doing Vince Russo booking shit. This is not even close to that. This is worse. Like, seriously, this is like 2000, 2001 WCW Thunder. And again, you had Kevin Sullivan, Bob Mould, Bob Ryder, and whoever else. Or this is like the days of impact where Matt Conway was working with like Hogan and Bischoff and they were putting stuff together. Like, wow. Oh, and I forget. uh, And then I forget. uh, Who was the other person I was working with? I forget now. It's just bad. It's just really bad. But I mean, really, maybe it's as bad as TNA impact. What? Like 20, I don't know, like. 2010, 2012, something like that. But even then, Impact had a lot of stars. Like, shit. And for people to go and complain about, you know... And then the thing is, the audacity of the fans. Listen, okay, I thank you for listening to the show. But you guys need some tough love, man. You guys then are so fucking upset about what's going on here with this product. Which I cringe with you. Do you understand me? And then I look at this crowd, and I look at what the other shows are doing, and look look at all these fucking cast-offs. Ask yourself the fucking question. Why do you think we're hating this fucking product so much on Raw and quite a bit on SmackDown? You know why? Because they had a lot of stars that have been there for a long fucking time. And what do they do? They didn't know what the fuck to do with them, which I still don't understand sometimes why certain stars are just gone. Like if they like their established stars or Dolph Ziggler's, you're telling me Dolph Ziggler st- still has like the stigma or the prowess of like, you know, if you wanted to bring back Zack Ryder over there or Kurt Hawkins, you're telling me that's much of a difference? Really? If Rusev was still around there, you don't think there would be any difference? But no, they're not going to worry about that. They don't give a shit. They don't care. I know I shouldn't get upset about this. I know I shouldn't really just rant about this so much, but, you know, what else am I going to do? This is what my wrestling show is about. This is what this podcast is all about. It's just so much. So fucking much to deal with. And I'm glad the other channels and the other shows have, have wrestling again because that's been good. But where we are right here, man, I'll tell you what. Disappointing. What can I say? And then we look to the other side to SmackDown. And I can go through it again. Rarely go through the list of the shows and what they're doing, but again, it is a little bit better. It's like, you know what? There's a thing where Vince and Bruce and all those people just really can't fuck around too much because Fox is watching. Uh, maybe USA needs to crack the whip on them because, or they don't care because USA is still getting good ratings for 1.7 million viewers, 1.76 for their show. Plus, you have to think of the matter is that, you know, they might be paying, but also there's not much production cost to go behind what they're doing because they have that $450,000 a month or whatever residency at Amway Center. So they're doing it on the cheap right now, which is good for them, I guess. But when I look at things, okay, Roman Reigns, Paul Heyman, Roman Reigns is now basically being positioned like the Brock Lesnar, which can work. 
Reigns is a heel. We're getting our season two. And then we get matches like, okay, Heavy Machinery, Miz and Morrison. Doesn't mean much. Now we don't even have Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville to even think about because they're not even around in the picture because of what happened in real life. So having these two tag teams face each other now doesn't make much sense anymore. But I guess just the attachment. Like Otis right now, he might be still money in the bank, but again, do we even think, is there any thought at all what, what Otis will do? <laughs> Why do you give him the briefcase? There's no logic behind that. There's nothing that tells me that Otis is going to do anything with a cash in where he's going to become world a world champion, so be WWE champion or universal champion. No fucking way. No way at all. And then Shane and Nia, tag team champs, they had their rematch with Bailey and Sasha, which that's important. Payback rematch. Got it. Then you have AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Sami Zayn. There you got a little triangle. Again, interesting. AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy. Not a match we've seen. I think we saw an impact. I think we did. But to see them here, everybody's going to say, oh, dream match because it's now in WWE. Bigger difference, right? Then the four-way match, number one contender for the Universal Championship. Big E knocked out beforehand. Again, so Big E and Sheamus now have a feud. Little thing. Sheamus now looks like a barroom brawler. That's his new thing because I guess the barroom match with uh, Jeff Hardy worked. I guess they think, well, we could put him in a hat. We could put him in the, uh, make him look like just some caricature from like the 1920s. Yeah. Real fucking smart. And Jay Uso is the one who becomes number one contender for the Universal title. Uh, okay. And by the way, nepotism. Because Roman Reigns got him in the match. However that worked out. Is there anybody right now in this four-way match that really was legitimate? I would say Sheamus because Sheamus at least has had the pedigree of being former champion. You could build him back up pretty quick. King Corbin? No. Matt Riddle? You try to do that. And then you let him lose to AJ Styles. Matt Riddle's now in the mid card. Whatever you could have done to keep him up at the top, you didn't. You buried him. You buried Matt Riddle for what? And that's the direction. Again, you know, Bray Wyatt has a face. He's going to get a new member of the Funhouse next week. So they're teasing stuff for next week. They're putting stuff together. There is no end of hot shot working you could do each week for either of these shows that's going to help it anywhere at all. The draft isn't going to make it a vis- any kind of a difference. I don't believe that at all. Not as long as the people that are booking it, the people that are producing it, the people that are behind this. I mean, honestly, ask yourself the question and, and don't make a joke about it. Just think about it. What if the elite had all these stars right here in AEW? You didn't have the guys there right now. So the Young Bucks would work with the tag teams and like the stars you got right now. Laid off. You put them over there onto AEW. I would come to think that I think that they would probably do a better job of booking. Like honestly, Scott Demore, Don Callis at Impact Wrestling, I think they could do a damn good job booking these stars way better. Can I tell you who would be able to book better than all this personally, I think? Court Bauer. And I know I would talk shit about him because he was always like, he never gave you the whole story. He's like, we'll see, let's see. But I'm telling you what, of what I saw on MLW, I saw better character development on that show. Because, by the way, Carry On Cross for a short time was in MLW, but didn't get much of a run. But with MLW, and though I can still think about it now because of the fact that I was watching the shows, the Hart Foundation, looking at Teddy Hart and Brian Pimbo Jr. and Davey, Hart, uh, uh, Davey Boy Smith Jr., the Dynasty, what a fantastic faction with Holiday, Hammerstone, and MJF. Like, it was really, it's a fun gimmick, right? Selena De Laurenta. The Impresario, 
and the whole thing with the Pronotionas Dorado. What a fucking great group that was. Contra? Hell, Contra. I'm sorry. I, I need MLW back. I'm glad the reset's coming back. That'll be fun. If Billy Corgan, <clears throat> if Billy Corgan had these, this group over here, he'd be doing circles if he had this kind of talent. But I'm going to say it. They're getting wasted. All the WWE talent, all this mid-card talent, as I call them, this maligned main roster of misguided NXT misfit mid-carders, they are poorly misused. Poorly underused, underutilized, not given their potential. It's so bad. And it's funny how everything goes like that. But again, the the dynamics of how we get this from those that were there and those that are still there, the defending of this company and those that are on the offense talking back about how this company has been. And every time we hear people talking about how the company was, not too long ago we heard Brian Myers talking about making comments in his his initial promo going into impact wrestling, talking about the company and being held down for decades for a decade. Excuse me. Miro comes out tonight. Best man for Kip Sabian and Benel before his wedding. And Miro says he spent 10 years in the same house with the same glass ceiling with an imaginary glass ring. And he said that quote, you could take that brass ring ring and shove it up your ass. There you go. It's what it is. Amiro is all elite. He joins all elite wrestling. What can I say, man? It's uh pretty good. I think they could do better with him than putting him in with uh, again, no Lana at this point, right? No aid in English to do that Cole Rusev they think was a gimmick. It was a goof gimmick, which got over by mistake. And then the company had to tamp it down. That's what they do. So there's that part. And then I look at what Stephen McMahon does, defending the company and saying how Vince is in touch. Okay. This is funny. So... Stephanie McMahon, she went on Gary Vanderchuk's podcast. Gary V, this big monster entrepreneur guy, uh, motivational type guy. Go look him up. Just look for Gary V, V E, and you'll know who it is. Gary Vanderchuk, I've heard this guy for 15 years. He's something else. So there were some highlights about what she was asked about by Gary Vanderchuk, and she was asked about the start of the Women's Revolution. And then asked, talk about Vince and the expansion of WWE. One of the feature questions, or the things that she commented on, was when she was asked if Vince listens to the people that give him advice. <laughs> this is funny. And by the way, Gary V. Objective, he has no no fight in the in the wrestling thing, right? I don't think he's a wrestling fan. I'm not sure if he is. But Stephanie McMahon being on as a woman entrepreneur, I understand the the reason why she's in there. Probably for some of the charitable work because Connor's cures out there. I'm guessing that's why she was on there. But also representing as chief uh, branding officer for WWE. So there's a lot to go by what she's doing. She says, quote, Vince listens to the fans. He listens to the live audience. He listens to social media. He also listens to our employees. He always said, you never know where a great idea is going to come from. He solicits that opinion. He talks to people. We start hearing from more people every time that leave this company. That's not the case. John Moxley said it very much said the same, same thing. Eric Young said it pretty much said the same thing. It's a little too consistent hearing that we're just having bitter talent leaving the company because they couldn't get that brass ring. And, of course, the podcast brethren out there that are WWE purists, of course, they're going to shit back on everybody because when they hear these shoot interviews, they don't like their company being tarnished. They don't like their legacy being tarnished, even though it's pretty bad right now. So, yeah, you can look for that. The Gary V audio experience. That's where the it was at. 
I want to talk about something else real quick before we, because uh, uh, I have nothing else to, to say anymore when it comes to the issues of the mid card of WWE. We could just keep going to do that another day. Really, I'm not going to just stay hampering on that. Well, what's been fun for the last week or so after this program, we heard the issues where WWE had some issues about how the talent was utilizing Twitch, YouTube, and Cameo to do content for their fans and to monetize from said content. Well, we heard about that there were stories where the wrestlers were no longer going to be allowed to use those platforms, but now there's been some blowback that the fans put out there, so WWE is now stepping back and clarifying their rules for what they can use. So... What happened was Dave Meltzer reported, and this is on Monday, that before Raw, the talent could be able to maintain their YouTube and Twitch channels, just need to do some of their real names. And the company said they would need to be informed about their accounts. So keep them transparent about what their accounts are, what they're doing, so they can monitor and observe what they're doing. Got it. This is a reversal from what people were told last week. Mark Carano told wrestlers last week they could not use their real names. No word of cameo, but the belief is among wrestlers that they will not be using that platform. Biggie indicated on Twitter that his days on cameo could be coming to an end. Now, third party deals were addressed by WWE in a statement on Saturday. They said, quote, much like Disney and Warner Brothers, WWE creates, promotes, and invests in its intellectual property. The stage names of the performers is a control and exploitation of these characters that allows the company to drive revenue, which in turn enables the company to compensate performers at the highest levels in the sports and entertainment industry, blah, 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 blah. Well, they're independent contractors. And yes, there's been a, a lot of times where you have a pinch as to you having the talent on the road consistently working, what, like 300 days a year? Well, now during the pandemic, we haven't had that so much. So limited amount of time, just doing tapings. So there's a bit of an argument that the town has right now that's justified because they're only getting paid by appearance, I guess, or if unless they're getting a contract. So I can understand them trying to make extra money. And why not? If they're independent contractors. I mean, if you want them on an exclusive contract, then make it as such and give them benefits and make them real employees. I mean, I don't know what that is with the contractual language that, precludes so many stars to go ahead and have to adhere to the rules of WWE when it comes to this kind of thing, but what are they going to do? Well, this creates the opportunity for AEW to respond back because they are encouraging because we've seen last on All Out. I mentioned this on the All Out post show, which I did do on Saturday right here at WrestlingIsReal.com. Well, Kip Sabian made sure to go and put a shot, which was endorsed by All Elite Wrestling, about his Twitch channel. Would you promote it again tonight? And Tony Khan put out an internal memo on Saturday. And here is what he said. He started by saying this, quote, For our people, I don't want people to be concerned that I'm going to stop them from trying to monetize their Twitch or even appearance money and things of that nature. I think there are gray areas. He stated there are different answers on different platforms, but there's a gray area when it comes to sponsorship. He gave an example of how if one of their stars was to try to get a Pepsi sponsorship under their Twitch account, it may seem like the wrestler is trying to circumvent the company. Quote, for the most part, I support people going out and trying to go out on Twitch and monetizing that platform. I'm okay with people monetizing your YouTube. What do you think is very clear here? Because a lot of the people have YouTube shows and famously being the elite. Young Buck show is not in the AEW channel. He states that AEW supports the show and the wrestlers are all over it, but it's not an AEW show. Yeah, the wrestlers have various vlogs and other shows on social media platforms. When he brought up Kip Sabian, he was talking about, well, this is different. Depending on what your platform you're talking about and you know you're, how you're addressing it, I definitely think I wouldn't tell people they can't do anything outside of the company, though that seems too unfair and pretty strong policy. There you go. That's what he said. Now, as for uh, Dynamite and AEW, we're learning that AEW is not. There was a thought that AEW Dynamite might become a three-hour show, which they're not. Good. 
so there's been talk about editing an extra hour of programming by All Elite Wrestling. Some fans think AEW will add a third hour to his weekly Dynamite show. And Cody Rhodes had to shut down that talk. He said, absolutely not, no third hour. Tony Khan talked to the press about how they still have plans to launch a second television show during a conference call with the media. He took to Twitter to note that he was once asked about a meeting whether he would be open to extending Dynamite, which he said no to the idea. He also mentioned the second show will be on a different night than Dynamite. He says the third hour on TNT won't be part of Dynamite, nor will it be on Wednesday. I was asked in a network meeting if I'd ever have any interest. I said definitely not, although I appreciated them asking the question. There you go. The second show is especially be coming out before the end of the year. Keep an eye on that. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to go ahead and cut a little short tonight because there's not much more to say. Again, I did do a post show for AW All Out. Check out it for yourselves. And we'll leave it there. Thanks again for listening in, finding the show as you always do. And remember, come back for another Wrestling is Real podcast because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling is Real podcast. Brought to you by KingofAmazon.com. Follow the King of Podcasts on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and on Facebook at Wrestling Is Real. Subscribe to the Wrestling Is Real podcast through all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. You can also look for episodes on his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O. 951. You can find all this information and more by going to the website wrestlingisreal.com.